Yes, Father God, I thank you again for everything that you've given to us. And Father, just pray over this offering, this sacrifice that's been brought this morning, Father, both here in this building, but also uh, with the wonder of technology. Father God, everything that's been brought into your storehouse this week, I pray, Father God, a blessing on it, your godly blessing. Father God, I pray there will be an abundance that comes with it. Father God, I pray there'll be wisdom for those who manage it. Father God, that actually will see the growth of your kingdom through the, the offering that was brought this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. And Father God, I just pray over James as he brings a word. Father God, I thank you for everything that you've laid on his heart for this morning. Father God, the passion for your name, the passion for an encounter with your spirit. Father God, I just pray that you'll um, enable him, speak through him, speak your truth to us today. And that, Father God, it, through his word, it just lays a platform for your spirit to move. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's, uh, it's great to be with you today on this wonderful um, spring day. Um, this week, I was in the beautiful town of Harrogate in Yorkshire, along with the leaders of City Church and also the leaders of all of the Elim Pentecostal churches across the UK, of which we are part of. And we were gathered in Harrogate, um, not to just enjoy the beautiful buildings and the scenery, but we were at a conference called the um, Elim Leaders Summit. And what that is, is it's thousands of leaders coming together to meet together as a ministry of believers and hear what God has to say for not only our individual lives as leaders, but also for the collected movement of the Elim Pentecostal Church. And so God spoke to me really powerfully on the first night. Um, there was an Australian pastor, fantastic preacher, called David Hall. And uh, David um, preached a message of Pentecost appropriate that it's Pentecost Sunday, and he talked about the Holy Spirit coming upon his church, and I was so powerfully moved, and I thought, oh, God's really speaking to me that I need to speak on Pentecost this Sunday. We're doing our Love Is series, and so we're taking a week off from that, um, because it was really important that, that I listened to God. But the truth is, is the next morning I woke up and I was like, oh, I've already done my sermon. I, I don't really want to write another one. And, oh, this is a bit scary, God, to like, to really pray that the Holy Spirit would fall. And so I thought, you know what? Never mind. Maybe, maybe I'm just a bit too excited. Maybe that was just for me. And so, so I thought, we'll stick with what it is. And then I went to the next evening, and, and Pastor David was speaking again, and God convicted me. He said, no, I have spoken to you. You need to speak on Pentecost this coming Sunday. So I started a new sermon, and I started speaking to Sue and, and Paul and looking at seeing how we could create space um, this Sunday for, well, the Holy Spirit to touches so that we could encounter him afresh. So that's why our worship's been a bit shorter, and we'll have a longer uh, section afterwards. Um, that's why the children went down a little bit earlier, so they can come up. And uh, that's why our youth will come in a little bit earlier as well. Can I just say is that we, we often think that, oh, the Holy Spirit, surely that's for adults. That's not for, for the young uns. But Kathy was teaching our, our children last week about the Holy Spirit, I mean, that was a brave thing to do when you'd be like, what's all this? And she actually prayed in tongues in front of them to explain and, and, and show what it was. And, and the youth have been looking at Pentecost. And so I didn't want this to be a thing that we hold for the adults, but I want to invite later on in the time of worship the children and the youth because we want to pray for them. We want them to encounter the Holy Spirit afresh. So um, this, uh, another thing that was a little bit different is we, we've had a few more worship uh, singers and a bigger band. It's great to have John and Sarah with us from, from Ireland. And um, if you don't know John, uh, the tall curly-haired guy, um, was with us and with Sarah for, for a, well in excess of a decade. And, um, you know, it's great to, to have them just visiting with us. Um, I just want to say to you guys, you've been, you were such a blessing and you, implement, you, you established... Uh, 
a foundation and a blessing in this church that lives on because of the work you've done. So even if things aren't what you necessarily thought or expected, where you are, God has used you and he is using you and he will use you again in the future. Um, and so when I finish my sermon, um, we're going to create a space for the Holy Spirit to, to move. And um, I'm expecting that he'll move powerfully this Pentecost Sunday and pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. Um, now, for some of you, this will mean that you're receiving the Holy Spirit for the first time as you invite Jesus into your life. For others, it will mean you'll be filled, uh, you'll, you'll have the Holy Spirit poured upon you for the first time. Some of you will speak in tongues for the first time. And for many of you, you will receive a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon your lives. And so today I want to explain who the Holy Spirit is and how he not only resides in us, but he also wants to fill us. And then we'll look at um, how we can remove any barriers that you may have put up in your mind or your heart um, that prevent the Holy Spirit working in your life. And then we'll worship and see what the Holy Spirit does. You know, I'm very conscious, and that th this is quite a scary thing to do, is to create a space in expectation, to change the service, of the, or the, the service, to take the front row out so that the space for coming to be prayed and to have healings and, and being touched by the Holy Spirit. And so we can create space, but you can't box the Holy Spirit in to a section of the service. But I feel so strongly that God's been saying he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit. And so rather than just trying to manufacture uh, and put a strategy in place for the Holy Spirit to move, we're just creating that space on the word that God has given. And it's worth noting as well that the, the word that God um, gave me was something um, that, that has been shared to other people. Not only has was God speaking to the, the churches of Elim Pentecostal about what he is doing in the movement, but also in the churches and what he wants to do. He's been saying similar things to those in our church. Um, I, I got a, a collection of messages from a few different people last night of something that God was putting on their heart. And I want to read um, one of them. Um, that I think is really significant for this morning. And this was from Leon. And what it was was um, Leon and B and Dominica and uh, Hannah and maybe some others were, Dominica, were, were, were gathered to go for a Chinese meal last night. And uh, they sit down, they're ready to go, and then all of a sudden they feel the Holy Spirit come upon them that there was more pressing things than to eat good Chinese food. And so they left. They didn't even eat, and they went to a house... And they just prayed, and they prayed. And, and this was the word that God gave um, Leon. I saw the skies parted and opening to the heavens above City Church, and everyone inside City Church received a blue glow in their hearts. Meanwhile, meanwhile there is a big dark cloud at the bay of Liverpool City, waiting to enter the city, but the glow in the people's hearts are growing and being spread to people out on the streets. And it's the glow that's keeping the big dark cloud at bay. So when God starts to speak to the individual in a collective movement of leaders and individuals within the church, I'm expectant, I'm hopeful that we are going to meet uh, the Holy Spirit afresh this morning. But I am conscious that trying to take half an hour to preach on the Holy Spirit as a standalone is a huge challenge. And um, so what we're going to do now is just pray that not only God just speaks to our hearts, but he steers my tongue in terms of the words to share. And what, what really is on my heart is that in the new year, we'll have an extended teaching on the Holy Spirit. So this is just the taste of what we're going to hear more about. So let's just pray. Father God, we thank you that you're not Father on your own, but you are the Father, Jesus the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. And so we pray this morning, God, would the Holy Spirit soften our hearts so that he may speak to us, so that the Holy Spirit may um, maybe meet us for the first time for those who don't know you. I pray for people right now who don't know you um, with their heart pounding right now will meet you this morning, give their lives to you and receive the Holy Spirit. I pray that your Holy Spirit as well will be poured out afresh, maybe for the first time or repeated times on each of us, so that rather than just having a really good Sunday at Pentecost, we actually are continually changed the day and every day as the Holy Spirit encounters us. I pray you'd lead my words and direct me so that what is an indescribable, huge person we're talking about would actually be brought in a simplistic way for each of us to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so imagine you're one of the 12 disciples and you're sitting there at the Last Supper round the table. You've, you've had some, some fish, you've had some olives, you've had your, your wine and your bread and Jesus is preparing what's going to happen. But you've spent three years spending time with Jesus. You've been a close, intimate friend with Jesus. You've witnessed the miracles, the multiple miracles that he's done. You've listened to the mind-blowing teaching that you still don't fully understand, but you're like, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, I'm going to leave. I'm not just going to leave the area. I'm going to leave the entire planet and go back to be with my Father in heaven. And then he tells you, you'll actually be better off because of my leaving. And you're turning to each other saying, what? Not only are you overwhelmed that he's going to go, the second thing is you'd be like, what on, how on earth could it be better without you, Jesus? And this is what Jesus said to his disciples in John 16. Your hearts are filled with sadness because I've told you of these things. But here's the truth. It is, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I don't go away, the divine encourager will not be released to you. But after I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will expose sin and prove that the world is wrong about God's righteousness and his judgments. It is to our advantage, not only the disciples, but all the believers, so that includes us. It is to our advantage that Jesus returned to his Father because we need the Holy Spirit to be our divine encourager. You see... The disciples were with Jesus, and they're like, this is amazing. But Jesus could only, because he, while he was God, he was also man. And there was only a certain degree to which Jesus could be stretched. And Jesus knew that by him going to the Father in heaven and then the Holy Spirit being sent, the Holy Spirit was not God and man. It was just completely God. And so there was no limitations of how the Holy Spirit could move. So that the Holy Spirit can be speaking, for example, on Pentecost Sunday, to each of our hearts, 100 plus people, but millions and billions of people across the world at the same time. So that is why Jesus said, it is better that I go and send the divine encourager. So who is the Holy Spirit? Notice that I put who rather than what. The Holy Spirit is um, often misinterpreted. Um, some people would view the Holy Spirit as a mystical force, something spiritual, but just spiritual for spiritual sake. Others would see the Holy Spirit possibly as an impersonal power that makes God available to followers of Jesus. But the Bible declares that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Kathy, amazingly, the week before was talking about heaven and the Trinity. Now, you see, uh, the things of God are simple and yet mind-blowing. And that's the most amazing thing is the Holy Spirit is able to speak to each of us to take things that are incomprehensible to the natural mind, to the mind and heart that does not know Jesus. But for those who have the Holy Spirit who know Jesus, the Holy Spirit can make 
the most complicated things simple. That's why a child could understand what heaven is and what the Holy Spirit is, even though people do PhDs on those subjects, the Holy Spirit can make it simple where they can grasp. And we're simple as well. Any PhD theology students here? I'm not. God is able to use the Holy Spirit to simplify things so we can understand. So, um, the Bible declares the Holy Spirit is God, that he's the third person of the Trinity, and, he, and that he has an intimate relationship with the followers of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit isn't a thing, an it. The Holy Spirit is a person who has an intimate relationship with those who have accepted Jesus into their life. So what does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit? Receiving the Holy Spirit is like the keys to a brand new house. There we go. There's the house. The moment you receive the keys, you gain access to the house, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit entering your life. You now have ownership, and the house is yours, representing the Holy Spirit's presence within you. Let me read that again. Receiving the Holy Spirit is like getting the keys to a brand new house. The moment you receive the keys, you gain access to the house, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit entering your life. You, you now have ownership, and the house is yours, representing the Holy Spirit's presence within you. So receiving the Holy Spirit occurs at the point of salvation. What salvation? It's when a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when you do, you're handed the keys, not to a brand new car, but a brand new house, in effect, that represents the Holy Spirit coming into you. It's deeply personal, personal and a spiritual experience that signifies the beginning of a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. If you, uh, later on, I'm going to give you the opportunity to actually invite Jesus into your life. But if for any reason you didn't feel you were ready or you had questions, the person I would direct you to is Flynn. Flynn, stand up. Um, Flynn um, met Jesus about uh, two and a half months ago. You can take a seat, Flynn. Um, and God fast-tracked what he did in Flynn's life with the Holy Spirit. So if you've got questions of what is it like when the Holy Spirit comes into you for the first time, Flynn would be a great person with first experience that is fresh. So, um, let's uh, take a look at John 20. They, the disciples, were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. In fact, let, let me just uh, pause there. Flynn, come to the front. Um, I'd forgotten. Um, Flynn is going in for surgery. What day? Wednesday. Um, this surgery was, was due to happen um, earlier, um, but it didn't because it was a cancellation. And Flynn's had some serious health issues, but through that, God led me to him in hospital to invite him to invite Jesus into his life, and he's radically saved. So um, this is throwing my order off, but we're going to pray now. Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, Shirley, uh, Kelly, and Ben, just come forward. Um, these guys have a heart for praying that the sick will be healed. So just, just come down to the front. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pray, and these guys are going to lay hands, and what we're going to do is we're going to pray that God heals Flynn. Now, I don't know how that works. That might be a case of bang is fixed right now and then. Uh, it may be a case that the surgery needs just bring his works outstandingly, and instead of three months recovering a wheelchair, there's a miraculous healing, okay? So that is why I've got these three people because these guys have got huge faith for seeing healing. So if I, rather than me praying, where's, where's the mic? Is the mic anywhere? Um, I'm just going to get um, each of these guys to pray for Flynn. Go for it. Praying for healing on this man. Father, Lord, I pray, O God, for your son, Flynn. I ask the God, let your power come upon him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Let it give strength to every part of his body. 
that every organ oh, and every tissue, God, respond, oh God, according to your word. You created him, you made him, oh God. And the life that he has, oh God, comes from you, oh God. So Lord, I ask that you breathe afresh on him, oh God. And cause every part that is not right to become right right now in the name of Jesus. And cause strength to flow, God, into every part of the system in the name of Jesus. And cause your power to drive out everything that is not right inside of him. Lord, I pray, O oh God, if it be your will, O oh God, that it goes into surgery, O oh God. I ask for a wisdom, O oh God, that has never been experienced by any of the doctors to come upon them, O oh God, to perform what they have to do, O oh God, and do it right, O oh God, and give him a perfect healing, O oh God, and a perfect surgery, O oh God, and a quick recovery, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, we are coming in your presence, Lord, and we live free in your presence. <coughs> and we ask you, Lord, to heal him in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, you know your ways. You know how you're going to do it, Father. But we believe and we trust in you that you will do it, Lord. It says in your word, behold how good and a pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Because you send there blessing, salvation, healing, everlasting life. So we believe it, Lord, and we're here together. One, one body, standing with fleeing, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to heal him in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for favor upon him. We pray that you fill him with your Holy Spirit. We pray that the spirit of fear will flee in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Lord Jesus, that he will be okay, that he will have peace that transpasses all understanding because he knows and he knows and he knows and he knows that you are with him, that you never leave him, that you never forsake him. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for Fling's life. We thank you for his faith. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for the healing that you provide for him in the mighty name yes, of Jesus. God. Hallelujah. Call back us Flynn, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I speak healing over you to every part of your body, to every cell in your body, Flynn. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. Oh, Sunday. Church, just, uh, just, I want everyone standing up and I want everyone to be reaching out their hands. We're just, you may not be familiar with this, but if you speak in tongues, speak in tongues now. If you don't, you can just spray out. We're going to pray for him collectively. Oh, Father God. Father God. Yes. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. They, the disciples, were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you have, you have received the Holy Spirit. You cannot accept Jesus into your life where you don't get the Holy Spirit. That is not something you determine. That is something that as soon as you accept Jesus into your life, he gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit indwells in you. If you haven't invited Jesus into your life, then you've not received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is something that just doesn't make sense to you because it's not something that can be explained in such a way you'd be like, oh, that's good logic. No, you need to receive the Holy Spirit, but you receive the Holy Spirit by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so um, what we're going to do um, is, um, 
if I'm re God's really sort of speaking to me and throwing me off, is I'm going to give you an opportunity now. I was going to do it at the end, but I feel as though if you do not know Jesus this morning and you have been here and you've heard the worship and you've heard uh, the prayers and you've heard the Bible and you've heard what I'm saying and there is something in your heart where you're just like, what is this? I want this. I want this Jesus of which you're talking about. Then I'm going to give you an opportunity now. So what I'm going to ask is, uh, if everyone can, and, and I, what I, I'm, I'm going to, I say this every week, but I mean it this week. Except you need to close your eyes and bow your head. And that's everyone, okay? Because I want to create an environment where there is no sense of anxiety of anyone who wants to give their life to Jesus. The only person watching right now is God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and myself. And I'm going to pray a prayer, and what this prayer is, is it's not there's a specific order of what I say, or that there's only one way to pray this prayer, but this prayer is simply going to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I'm sorry for the way I've lived things. I'm sorry that the way that I made everything about me, and I want to give my life to you. I want to receive your Holy Spirit, and I want my life to be transformed here on earth, knowing that I have all eternity in heaven. Jesus says, when you are saved, your sins are washed away, and when, you're, when you die, God doesn't see your brokenness and your sins. He sees someone forgiven, and he welcomes you into heaven. So I'm just going to pray this prayer, and you can just repeat these words after me. Maybe this is a prayer of recommitment. Maybe you've given your life to Jesus before, but you have wandered and you are, you've just been nowhere and you want to give your life back to him. Maybe this is the first time you want to invite Jesus into your life. So just repeat this prayer after me. You don't need to shout it. You can just whisper it out. So, and, and maybe those who, who already know Jesus, maybe you can say this as an encouragement to, to help um, those who, who don't know Jesus. So, dear Jesus, I want to invite you into my life. I'm sorry for the mess I've made of my life. I'm sorry how I've made it all about me. I ask for your forgiveness. And I want to walk in your ways. I want to know now the purpose you have for my life. So that I may serve you and your people. And so that I receive eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, eyes closed, heads bowed. If that's the first time you've prayed that prayer, or you've given your life back to Jesus having wandered, with no one looking aside from uh, God and myself, I'm just asking you to raise your hand right now. That's the first time you've prayed that prayer of recommitment. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? If your heart's pounding, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to do this. You can put your hand up and pull it down as quick as you can. No one's looking aside from myself. Anyone else? Thank you, Father. I'm not going to rush on from this. If, if your heart's pounding and you... And God is speaking to you. You may not even know what that means. But there's a sense of, oh, yes, I've prayed that and I want to. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. You can open your eyes. And I say for those people, um, whether that was the first time, whether that was a recommitment to God, um, at the end of the service, well, after this message, we're going to, worship and I'm going to ask those two people to come forward just so I can pray for you um, but that's the best decision you've either made or remade to invite Jesus into your life and again with Jesus in your life you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you now I spent a whole day not agonizing but trying to get my head around the fact that the Holy Spirit comes, dwells in us, but can also fill us. 
um, in such a way that I could explain it because, again, that is something. How can the Holy Spirit dwell in me and then fill me and the two things are separate, okay? So it is, it is crazy. But back to this house analogy. So let me run you through that house. Receiving the Holy Spirit is like getting the keys to a brand new house that symbolizes the Holy Spirit entering your life. You now have ownership and the house is yours, representing the Holy Spirit's presence within you. I should say, this is not my analogy, um, but I did a lot of work reading around trying to find a good one. So, the Holy Spirit resides in you like getting that new house. But what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And there's the next picture. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is like turning on all the lights in a house and opening all the windows to let sunlight pour in. Every room and corner is illuminated, signifying the Holy Spirit's in, uh, how the Holy Spirit's influence touches every part of your life. Filling you completely and shining outward, impacting both your internal state and your interactions with the world. So the Holy Spirit, like that house, kind of comes in you, but there's something more. There is a filling of the Holy Spirit. And the practice of the filling of the Holy Spirit was something that we see throughout Jesus' life. I'm not going to unpack all of these because there's too much to cover uh, in terms of scriptures, but basically Jesus depended upon the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.14, then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Jesus needed this ongoing partnership with the Holy Spirit to complete his God-given mission. How much more then do we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to complete our mission? If Jesus needs filling with the Holy Spirit, that we absolutely categorically need filling with the Holy Spirit. And why? Well, Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The series of love is, we've been looking at how the things of the Holy Spirit and God are really impossible to do in such a way that honors God without inviting the Holy Spirit to work in us. You can get people who don't know Jesus, and they can be kind and gentle and good to a degree, but the thing is, is that's in their own strength. God has these fruits of the Spirit that He wants to work in us through the Holy Spirit, so it doesn't then just look good on me. You don't see something in me and think, oh, James, he's a, he's a kind guy. Like if I didn't know Jesus. No, what he wants it to be is that someone looks at me and maybe doesn't know Jesus and was like, gosh, there was a kindness with that guy. What was that? It doesn't lead to me, it leads to God. And that's something that only the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. Finally, it's most important to understand that being filled with the Holy Spirit is an ongoing process rather than a one-time event. So when you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you. That's one time only. The Holy Spirit is a gift that God gives you to reside in you, to live in you. But being filled with the Holy Spirit is an ongoing process, not a one-time event. Just like physical or mental growth, spiritual growth is a lifelong journey. And the continual process of being filled with the Holy Spirit bears fruit in growth and spiritual maturity while serving the body of Christ and ultimately glorifying God. Today is Pentecost Sunday. What's Pentecost? Well, Pentecost was actually a celebration of the early wheat harvest in the months of May and June in Palestine. So why is uh, Pentecost important to Christianity? Well, we're not bothered about the wheat harvest. Um, What we're bothered about is what happened at the festival of Pentecost. You see, at the festival of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit invaded the church. 
in, and that's recorded in Acts 2. So Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost, all believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them gave his ability. So Jerusalem was filled with visitors who had come to celebrate Pentecost, that had come to celebrate this wheat harvest. And then, early in the morning that Paul read about before, they heard these bunch of guys. And these guys weren't, weren't from all over the world. They were local guys. You could tell looking at them the way, well, just, you know, what they wore, the, you know, genetic makeup. These were local guys. And the, 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 the disciples started to speak in languages that each of these people from all across the area and continent could understand. And some were curious about what was going on. Others were dismissive. Oh, they're drunk. I don't know about you. If you, if you, ever, if you, ever, you, know, if you had a glass of wine or drink a beer and you can speak French, that'd be quite a handy thing. Um, but uh, no, they were speaking in a way that through the Holy Spirit, it was audible in the language of the people who then you know, heard God moving. So Peter, ever the spokesman, but now in, in, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, stood up to speak to them and about repentance and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And about 3,000 people accepted Jesus there and then. And this event marked the beginning of the church's mission to spread the message of salvation to the ends of the earth. So, we've talked about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Um, I've led, you know, give you the opportunity to invite Jesus into your life so that you may receive the, the, the Holy Spirit. And a couple of people raised their hands. There might be other people still who thought, oh, I should have prayed that prayer. I didn't want to put my hand up. Um, there's still going to be opportunity. If you want to come forward, we'll pray for you. So what are the barriers that you may have erected in your heart that stops you from receiving the Holy Spirit today and accepting? In fact, I've already done this. There we go. I've done this bit. So this is the sense of we're going to look at some of the barriers that you've maybe put up in your mind or your spirit or your heart to say, oh, Holy Spirit, I'm not too sure about that. And so one of the barriers that we've already overcome was that in Acts 19, Paul um, asked some of the believers in Ephesus when he was going around preaching, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So in your hearing, each of you know, if you didn't before you came here, there is a Holy Spirit and God wants to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's no longer a barrier. Oh, I didn't know such a thing existed. Uh, before I carry on, can I just thank you and welcome the youth back? Um, guys, I know you've been hearing about the teaching of Pentecost. Now, the reason I've invited you guys up to join us is the things of the Holy Spirit are not just for when you turn 18 plus. They are for everyone, no matter what your age. And so um, when, when we talk about these things, and when I'm, we're about to, to pray for people, I'm going to offer you a specific invite to receive prayer to, um, if you've not already, give your life to Jesus. And also then to receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So everything you're listening is not just, oh, this is the stuff for the old folk. This is for you. Okay, so I want you to have your ears pricked. A second barrier that we can put up um, to the Holy Spirit meeting us is um, this sense of, if the Holy Spirit wants to touch me, he can. Um, I'm doing my thing. He's doing his thing. If the two meet, great. But I'm not taking a step that way. The Holy Spirit needs to be knocking on my heart. Now, it's a funny thing, this is the Holy Spirit and God does knock on our heart. He does whisper to us. But you see, the key thing is, is 
God will never force himself upon anyone. He will never force the Holy Spirit upon you. He's not just going to like, while you're asleep, you know, you don't want the Holy Spirit, and he goes, bang, have some of that. No, he only does it when someone's heart is open and willing. See, Jesus promised to those who, uh, who, those who ask, seek, and knock will find their request fulfilled. Jesus said to those he was teaching, um, and this is in Luke 11, if sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Those who ask him. Now, there are times where people just, you know, we'll have seen in church and the Bible where God just comes upon people and it's like they got saved and they got the gift of tongues and they, they were infilled in the Spirit at the same time. Sometimes the orders get, you know, it, God can just say here, You've got it all in one go. But for those of you who know Jesus, who want to receive the Holy Spirit, you need to ask. And so God, uh, Jesus in his teaching basically gets rid of the sense of, well, if you want it, it's a case, uh, it's a case of, look, if you want it, just ask. And that's what we're going to do soon. Um, a, a, another thing that can be a barrier um, to receiving the Holy Spirit is I've been put off with what I've seen. We all know that person who's been filled with the Holy Spirit who's a bit strange, okay? I'm going to put it out there that's a bit strange. And you may say, I don't want to be filled with the Holy Spirit because I don't want to be like that rather strange person. Now, the truth is, is that person was strange before the Holy Spirit came upon them. <laughs> now, I'm a bit strange, okay? Um, you ask my uh, wife and children, and when I'm with them, there's more peculiarity that if I shared that with the masses, you'd be like, we're leaving the church, okay? <laughs> so I'm not saying a bit of strange, a bit of weird is a bad thing, but it's to use that discernment that even though we can have our peculiarities, the Holy Spirit supersedes some of the foibles of our life. Now, there are times you'll have seen in this church and others over the years where the Holy Spirit's moving, and this is the difficulty for me and Paul when we lead a meeting, is you will see things going on and you're like, I'm not sure about that. Because the Holy Spirit meets each person to edify the community. And if someone starts to get really odd, you know, um, uh, you know, I, was in, I heard a, a preacher saying there was a woman who started to bark like a dog. Now, the Holy Spirit does not get you to bark like a dog. That is a distraction. And the preacher in this situation said, look, if you're going to bark like a dog and be extravagant, do so, but just in a side room, okay? So it's not that, um, that the whole, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you that you get weird, okay? Now, things that are supernatural happen, People will start to laugh and cry and shout and shake. Some people may go down in the Holy Spirit on the floor. These things edify the body where we're like, wow, we believe in a supernatural God. So strange is okay, but strange, you're not going to become strange if you receive the Holy Spirit. And then um, the, the last thing, and I'll speak to the children in a second, is you may be thinking, you know what? I already speak in tongues. I've already received the gift of tongues, so I don't need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. But speaking in tongues doesn't tell anyone that you, you are currently filled with the Spirit. It just tells us that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit in the past. So if there's a sense in your heart where you be like, I don't need this, you know, Eight years ago, I got the gift of tongues. I'm done. No, the Holy Spirit wants to constantly fill us. So if you've got the gift of tongues, but you don't, you've not had fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, yes, it's a gift, but there is so much more. So it's not a case of I am the complete package. I've received the Holy Spirit. I've been filled. No, he wants to fill you again and again and again.
understanding the Holy Spirit, and this is I kind of come to a close, is understanding the Holy Spirit's role in our lives is crucial for deepening our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is not just a distant entity, but a personal friend who resides in us, guiding, comforting, and empowering us. By recognizing and removing the barriers that can hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we open ourselves to a profound spiritual transformation. <clears throat> so um, I want to welcome the children back. Children, it's fantastic to have you here. A few minutes ago, I welcomed the youth who came back in. And I know in Children's Church, you've been hearing from, from Kathy and other leaders about things that are big and significant. You've been hearing about what's heaven like, about the Holy Spirit. You've been, yeah, you know, you've been learning about what is this Holy Spirit and, 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 and You've had questions, and for some of you, it may have been a case of, wow, I don't get that, or maybe you have got it. And what I've been speaking to your parents and the adults about is saying that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a gift that God wants to give each of you. It's not just for when you turn 18. He wants to give it you when you ask for it. And so what we're going to do, and I'd ask the band to, to come back. <clears throat> um, we are going to, um, over this next, uh, again, this is a bit of a different one. I'm not putting a time on it, but we're going to have a longer time of worship. Um, we're going to have a time where we're just going to sing one song, first of all. And I'm just going to let the, the Holy Spirit speak to you. And then, after that first song and at different intervals, we're going to give opportunity for different groups of people to be prayed for. So, children, youth, everything that happens from right now is for you as well. There may be things that you think, I'm not too sure, and I'm not going to put any pressure on anyone. But even at a young age... If the things I'm talking about are things that you want, you want to meet Jesus and give your life to him, you want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, then this is open to you. The one thing I've not really mentioned much, but it's, it's been there, is the gift of tongues. Speaking in tongues is, a, is another kind of gift that the, the Holy Spirit gives, which is a heavenly language where we're able to speak in such a way that it's not an earthly language, but it is allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us. The children will have seen um, Kathy last week praying in tongues. I'm sure the youth will have noticed it. And that's something we're going to invite for those of you who want to, to receive that gift of tongues to receive. But again, some churches will uh, have this sense of like, everyone's got to receive the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues isn't something God gives everyone. He'll often give it at different stages. So there's no sense of pressure that if you say, well, I want this gift of tongues, but it doesn't happen there and then, that there's anything wrong. God has good gifts for each of us, and he gives us those gifts when he knows we are ready for them. So I'd maybe just ask each of you, you, over this next sort of, probably half an hour, stay seated, stand up, kneel down, come to the front. There's no, or there's, there's no regular routine here, but we're just going to invite God and the Holy Spirit to meet us. So I'm going to pray first of all, and then we're going to worship. So Father God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this wonderful gift that you have given those who follow you. I just pray now as we worship and we've sort of created this, you know, extended period of time for each, uh, for those who want to, to invite you into their life, to be touched by the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to receive the gift of tongues and maybe gifts of prophecy in other words, that we just create this space with our hearts open and say, we want to meet with you. We want to see the supernatural giftings that are from you take place. 
so that we may receive gifts ourselves and that we may delight and rejoice in seeing others touched by you. In your name we pray. Amen.